Hello, and welcome to the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation's CISM Live Series, where we connect with critical incident stress management subject matter experts live on YouTube. My name is Kelly, and I'm the Development Coordinator for ICISF and your host for today's CISM Live Series. My guest speaker today is one of ICISF's faculty, Mark Junkerman, aka Junk. Uh, Mark is an active law enforcement commander in Maryland with more than 27 years of experience to include over 14 years serving in various CISM roles at the local, state, and regional level. During his tenure, he has placed a special emphasis on advocating for resilience-centric management and leadership primarily within the public safety and public service arenas. Welcome, Junk. Hey, how you doing, Kelly? So today we're actually going to be discussing first responders finding music within the noise. Mm -hmm. um, we are currently in the midst of challenging times due to the pandemic. Right. Uh, first responders are often trained to be in control of situations within their professions, which is uh, presenting many challenges during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean when you talk about uh, finding music within the noise? So, you know, before we even talk about first responders, just just people in general, yeah, uh, it, we, we know as much as we like to be, you know, rebels and 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 kind of take a walk on the wild side every once in a while, uh, people are generally pack animals mm -hmm. and they also like consistency. They also like a little bit of predictability um, when you throw them out of kilter when they lose that sort of balance that stasis that can be very challenging just in and of itself so you you have a situation now with with covid with a pandemic and that has thrown everybody sort of off kilter and using sort of that musical sort of um, example, it's, it's like you're out of tune all of a sudden, like the things that you normally did aren't working. You're the finger, your fingers don't, you can't find the chords. It doesn't sound right. You can't find your song and suddenly you're inundated with noise. Um, in order to kind of get that balance back, what we know works is a person who's experiencing some sort of of change, whether it's good change or bad change in their life. There's, there's two key elements we talk about that, that help with that process. The first is information. You need good, valid information and you need it in a timely fashion. Well, now flip back to the pandemic. There's not a whole lot of information because this is, again, there's historical references, but you know, this is sort of new territory for most of us. Um, so the information is not only um, comes in drips and drabs and bits and pieces, but it comes from a myriad of different platforms because we are in this technological sort of communication age. It's no longer a 24 hour news cycle. It's like a 24 second news cycle. I mean, you can, you can turn your phone on and turn it off and it's already updated the news. So that creates a challenge and it creates a sort of a, sort of a level of angst. I like to say, the other thing uh, is this support idea. So, you know, we know, and that's even more important than the information is having a support system to rely on. Well, that's contraindicated by <laughs> this pandemic. You know, those things we normally do to find comfort, those people we normally go to, those groups, those, those entities, um, there's a whole different new set of rules. You know, the, um, the, the proximity, proximity is now a bad thing where before that was part of the comfort. So you're in a situation, as I like to say, it's a, a dark room's not scary because it's dark. Well, I should let me rephrase it. A dark room is scary because it's dark. Once you flick the light on, you might realize that, yeah, it really is scary in here, but it's a known scary. And if you have a friend that can go in there with you, it's even less scary. We've taken out those two key elements of sort of balance and processing and, and how to kind of navigate through life. We've kind of taken them out of the equation. With, with this pandemic. And again, going back to the music, it's it's like you're in a band now and you're trying to play a song and everybody's playing a different time, a different pace and the and the notes aren't sounding right. And it's it's creating a situation where where people it, it's unnerving. Um, it's disturbing. So now we throw in this whole idea of a first responder in this pandemic. Well you know, the vast majority of first responders that I know, uh, the vast majority of first responders I've been exposed to 
truly want to do good. They want to make things better. They truly believe that when they get to a scene or get to something, their job is to help make it better than it is or to, to uh, if not fix a problem, at least mitigate some of those circumstances. In order to do that, we are just by nature and by training and by culture control centric. Okay, because you get there, you control the situation, you try to fix things, you try to adjust, you do your best. So you throw in this thing called a virus, and the 911 dispatcher can't talk somebody through on the phone, like virus procedures like you can do with CPR, and the firefighter can't spray water on it, and the medic can't slap a tourniquet on it, and the police officer can't put handcuffs on a virus. Right. So, you know, even a clinician. Clinicians, they, they can't sit and counsel a virus. A chaplain can't provide spiritual support to a virus. Well, it's not a tangible item that they can, you know, get their hands on and try and, try and you know, grasp. Exactly. But you forgot, I'm, I'm a first responder. I have a cape. I, I'm supposed to fix everything. I have a big S on my chest. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't control this situation. That causes even more angst. Um, well, and that, that kind of naturally uh, actually goes into my next question for you, mm -hmm. which is based on um, from what you've seen, how has the pandemic been particularly challenging to first responders uh, that, that you've personally seen, both within the law enforcement community and other professions? Yeah, and, and circling back, it, it comes down to sort of a little more succinctly a, a, a lack of control. Um, so when you lack that control, you feel helpless. And first responders don't do helpless. We don't, we don't, you know, we're, we're taught if you can't, you know, you fake it until you make it. Um, if you are out there and you look like you know what you're doing, it's, that's better than, you know, sort of breaking down, losing it. Well, this is a situation where we don't know what to do, frankly. We're learning as we go. And people are looking to us as hey, you're, you're the solution, you're the answer. And what we're telling them, because that's normally what we are, we're telling them we're not, we, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But we can't say that. We have to, well, you know, you know there's some harumph and, and, and whatever. We feel helpless and we don't do helpless. The other thing is, you know, this whole, this whole realm of, of we protect and we take care of people. And, you know, we are particularly... Um, we're extremely protective of our own, particularly our families. We can't even protect our children, our wives, our husbands, our partners, our friends, our parents, our brothers, our sisters. We can't protect even the people who are closest to us, let alone the people we are sworn to protect or who we want to protect. So that really sort of humbles us as first responders. We we go through this world again, thinking that we're the solution, we're the answer. We have the big S on our chest. That's never, that's never been the truth. But when you dump the, the magnitude of this and the, the nature of this particular challenge where you're actually at a loss, it, it's, it, it's not, again, it's not only humbling, but it can be debilitating um, because first responders in general, we're not, uh, I know this is a shock. We're not really good at emoting and sharing our feelings and, you know, letting our guard down. So you, you keep eating that pain and that, you know, uh, that, that uh, those disappointments and that fear um, and that guilt that you can't do your job. So it's hard. It's hard for first responders, hard for everybody, but particularly for first responders. And that includes our, our God bless our, our, our EM, you know, our, our our ER staff and our doctors and our dentist and everybody else who's out there, social workers who are out there laying it on the line. I mean, there's first responders is not just about people wearing a badge at this point. So correct. Yeah. It's also all those frontline workers as well. Absolutely. Um, that are battling everything. So uh, uh, regarding CISM then, mm -hmm. how do you think uh, critical incident stress management or CISM has adapted and will continue to adapt during this ongoing pandemic? Yeah. And, and, you know, for, for me, the biggest takeaway from doing this for a while is so, you know, this, this idea of CISM, um, this idea of uh, uh, critical incident stress management is basically for me, I guess the best way we can boil it down in a nutshell, it is a systematic uh, uh, evidence-based sort of gold standard approach of helping people navigate the choppy waters of life that inevitably happen. 
Um, what we as particular first responders sometimes forget is, you know, we tend to focus when we talk about missionaries. So there's, there's, there's missionaries that include prevention, protection, response, mitigation, and recovery. They're the five, what we call missionaries. We as first responders tend to focus on train. Uh, we're, we're very heavy when it comes to response and mitigation. We respond and we fix the problem. Usually those things last anywhere from minutes to a couple days. What we tend to not be very cognizant of is the back end that the recovery can take years, depending on the situation and the front end. And I think that is where this pandemic may really help us sort of, I, I don't want to say rethink because it's always been there, but kind of reanalyze what this system looks like. Comprehensive, integrated, systematic, multifaceted approach. Mm -hmm. The way you beat a pandemic is inoculation on the front end. Once you've identified it is to create, you know, you do the things to respond and mitigate, but the way we're going to beat this is through some sort of vaccine that applies to our first responders in, their mission, their life, not just first responders, everybody. What are you doing on the front end now? The, you know, are you practicing the notes? Are you, are you writing your own music? What are you doing now? So when it comes time to perform that, when you have to play that you're ready. And the hope is that this will allow us to start focusing on that front end. And in the best case scenario, there's less people who are seriously impacted, but those people who are, because there's a good triage system and there was good prevention and protection along the way, but those people who are, there's enough resources to actually help them, which are two of our biggest challenges. Sometimes we, we uh, I don't know if the term is over-treat, but you know, when in doubt, we put everybody into a category and some people truly don't need to be there. Um, there's other things that they probably need in addition to mental health uh, or, or, or peer support or some sort of, you know, behavioral health intervention, there, that may be part of it, but there's other things that, you know, we, we need as part of that package or we get so many people because we've waited so long. It's, it's like, the, you know, it's, it's like the guy who, you know, has been eating, uh, you know, bad food and, and, and whatever for 40 years and then goes in the doctor, the doctor says, you know, you, you, you need a bypass and you go, well, you're just, just going to do that and fix it. Right. You just, you just go in there and fix that. Well, yeah, maybe, but you know, maybe not. Well, what do you mean? You're a doctor. You're, you're supposed to wave your magic wand and fix it. Well, that I can do certain things, but if you're not part of your own solution, then you're part of your own problem. And I think a lot of times we forget that where, it immediately becomes this, you know, they need behavioral health because nobody's tried anything else or nobody even wants to attempt to do anything else. It's just easier. And that's not fair to our clinicians or our clinicians have been telling us for years, you need to do things to keep yourself healthy along the way. Now we have people who present themselves who are in very acute need and there's just not enough clinicians to go around. So I, I think basically that if we can start working more as there's a term, there's a, a, a book, Pat Van Horn wrote this book called Left of Bang. It's an old military term. If we can work left of bang, if we can risk manage before the bad things happen, anticipate, do an analysis of what we think, what are the probabilities, actually do the math. And then what I like to say, win by design, not by default, start creating a plan when it hits the proverbial fan, we're better prepared, we have a better response, and that is going to lead to a less, in some cases, traumatic response for people on the back end. So that's what I hope we get out of this. Well, and one of the things you advocate as well is a management approach to wellness, resilience, and even peer support. So um, I know you touched a little bit on this a, a little bit ago, but can you, can you explain that and, and kind of discuss a little bit more about that? Sure, so I, I am not a clinician. I'm very fortunate, I've been around excellent clinicians. I've had excellent clinicians. I've, I've gone to excellent commit clinicians. You know, I'm the, you know, I'm like, like that old, there's an old commercial way back in the hair club for men, you know, I'm not only the president, I'm a client. So, you know, I, I realized <laughs> through my own travels that I needed that clinical help and it, it did wonders for me. So. Um, I'm not a clinician. So 
I, I don't have the expertise or the skill set to, to speak to, you know, therapies and those sort of things. What I do kind of have some experience in is, let's say, crisis leadership or leadership in, 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 you know, challenging situations. So a lot of what I'm trying to do now is take what I kind of do best and, and break it down and hopefully create a path that reminds me every day, but also helps in my world, my troops, my, my people who I, who I lead, um, my people who I work with, my peers, the, my, even my bosses, whoever. And it comes down to this idea of, of planning to thrive. Um, and there's, there's kind of four parts for me from a management standpoint. The first is understanding your culture, warts and all. You know, you have, we, culture is a construct of this, to me, knowledge, tradition, and experience. It's what we know, your head. It's what we feel at your heart. That's the tradition. And when you take your head and your heart and you take it out for a spin, that's your hands. That's the experience. And sometimes you go, that was really cool. And other times you go, yeah, we ain't ever doing that again because that was like silly. And that's where we get that experience. So first responders, uh, law enforcement in particular, we have a very, a very sort of unique culture. Understanding that, adapting that, of letting that evolve and embracing the good, but not being afraid to challenge what's not working. That's the first step because you kind of have to know where you're coming from. Second step for me is, is what I call being, being armed for risk. And ARM is an acronym for something we as first responders do every second of our lives. When we, when we go in for a cup of coffee at the 7-Eleven, when we are cutting the grass, when we're whatever, brushing our teeth, we assess the situation. We recognize and prioritize what needs to be addressed. And then we do one of two things. Once we figure out what's going on and what we need to address, we decide, do we need to mitigate it? Do we need to do something about it? Or do we monitor? Do we just kind of keep our eyes on it? Think of it like a radar screen. What's on your radar? In a perfect world, we want to be able to detect things well out, identify them and have a plan because that distance buys us time. So that's the first step. So we understand our culture, then we arm ourself, ourselves for this um, uh, for this risk management. And then we talk about what I said before, we want to win by design, not by default. Um, you know, in my world, my men and women wear body armor when they're out on the street, they better have their body armor on and, and you know, my piece of the world. It's not because the body armor is going to save their life. It's because if you look statistically, people who wear body armor have a much higher probability of surviving a deadly encounter. That's what we're doing. We're playing the odds. In the casinos, when you're in those casinos, people think the odds are tremendously, you know, sort of skewed to the casino. They're not. It's just it's just a few percentage points. We always want to be holding the 51 percent versus the 49 percent because that gives us our edge. And that is winning by design. And in order to do that, you need to have a plan. You can't just. It's great to be able to adapt and kind of wing it and be fluid, but there's got to be some kind of planning and thought. So that's the third step. So we've talked about our culture. We understand that. We're now kind of armed for this risk management. Now we have a plan. The next part is to build a culture, not just a program. And that's where, you know, how many times have we all seen a, a, an incident happen or a mandate come down or something which prompts a response and all of a sudden there's a flurry of activity and we take a square peg and we stick it in a round hole and we pat ourselves on the back because we have a program or a team or a whatever. And in the end, what we did is we, we basically either check the box or we, we have something that the stop got that's not going to last. To me, this truly, this truly manifests when you take care of that me, you're, you're following those tenants on your own, where you're, you know, you're evaluating risk, you understand your culture, you have a plan. And every day you commit to a mission and then take ownership for yourself as an individual. If you take care of the me, we can start taking care of the we, where we're accountable to and for each other. And that's where this, that's where this comes in, where this idea of I'm building a culture. Um, you know, in our world, policies and procedures are everything. But I go around and I ask when I do my little classes or my presentations, who in here has kids, raise kids, you know, hands go up. What's your toothbrush policy? What's your teeth? Is it, is it, you know, policy 1-5-7-2, you, you know, and it was adjusted on. No, you don't have a policy, but somehow 
everybody manages to brush their little nasty teeth, right? Sometimes twice a day, sometimes more. Why? Why is that? Because around here, we brush our teeth. So that's this concept, this, four, this kind of four-part approach where understanding your culture, understanding and arm yourself for risk or against that risk, inoculate mm -hmm. yourself, have a plan, and then build a culture, not a program. And if you overlay that over strategic planning, culture, that's your hiring. That's who you bring into your, into your and help them understand and integrate. That arming yourself for risk. There's your strategic planning, your mission and vision statement. Win by design, not by default. There's your policy and your training. And then you're building a culture. That's your leadership and your succession planning. You do a big loop around there. You've just created a classic management loop. And you're doing the same things um, that can overlay in CISM. It can overlay in your job. It's taking this concept and overlaying it. So all those cool components that we have that make up CISM, have a place to live and fit and kind of flow. And that helps you build that culture instead of just that team or that program. Um, and that's what we circling all the way back, what we talked about, what I hope we've been doing. And it's been there for a while. I mean, if, if, if you look at, um, you, you know, the Johns Hopkins triple R model, I think it was Mike, uh, Mike Kaminsky, who, who started that, Dr. Everly, George Everly was, was part of that group, where it talks about, you know, front-end inoculation is basically what it is. It's, it's, it's building that resistance all the way up through, you know, recovery, resistance and resilience and recovery. So this has been around for a while. I just think sometimes in the heat of the moment, we, we lose it in the lights, you know. We forget that most of the work that is, most of the work, or let me say, a lot of the work that we do, a lot of the work that we should be doing is up front, and that's going to create sort of, uh, uh, that's going to have an impact in a positive way on the back end. So, um, well, so that way individuals and organizations are prepared when a crisis does occur or when something happens. Right, right. Um, so what do you predict the new normal is going to look like as the world begins to reopen? Because we do have, you did mention that, you know, we do have vaccines coming out and, uh, for, you know, crisis responders and everyone are starting to get those vaccines. So what do you predict? I, I think, I, I think this is me. I think we are going to the new normal. There, there is definitely going to be some things that are obviously different in terms of hopefully in our preparation and technology, um, the use of technology, you know, the ability to, to what we're doing right now. Um, you know, and look, I'll be the first one to say, I love to be in a room, but you know, there are times where this is a great platform, the ability to share ideas, to exchange ideas, to, um, communicate, to socialize over a technological platform. I think, I think that's here to stay to a certain extent because it is, you know, the classic term, a force multiplier. It does create efficiency and effectiveness. So I think that's going to be part of it. I think you're going to have some people who have, and, and this, is, this is just me, this is what I see. You know, this pandemic has limited some of the usual outlets that we have to um, express ourselves, to relieve tension, to engage. We've had a lot of time to self-reflect. I think you're gonna see some, some mindfulness out of this. I think you're going to see some people, and we're, we're seeing it, this social evolution, this sort of cultural, um, which, which you any, any animal, any society, you have to evolve or you die. You, you, that's the reality. Now, how you do it, the methodology, how painful it is, there's better ways to do that than others. But I think we're going to see people who are actually have had a chance to take a look at themselves and kind of maybe figure out who they are, what they want, what they want to be. So you may see certain certain areas, uh, you know, people are working online. We're going to have, I think, more educated people to a certain extent. We, we talk about, you know, the kids can't get in the classroom and they're losing something. That's true. But we've also opened up platforms where any place, any time, if you have an internet connection and some sort of device, you can educate yourself. So I think people are going to be more educated and informed. And I think that's going to, a, 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 I think that's going to adjust how we uh, adapt and how we choose uh, to live our lives. But the flip side is uh, people are people. And I think while there is going to be some new norms, I can speak for me. I can't wait 
so we can get back into a conference mode. I can't wait till you can go to a ball game. I can't wait to, you know, go to a concert or, or go to my, you know, my favorite watering hole with my, with my friends or, or, you know, whatever. Um, we're social animals and we need that contact. So I think there may be also a reawakening in that and a reconnection. Um, and I think that once that happens, if we can, you know, in the, in the best sort of, uh, the, the, the best sort of, of model of, you know, Aristotle's model of, of you can't be insufficient or excessive, that golden mean, if we can find a place to balance, you know, our individuality with, mm -hmm. with the culture and, and growing our culture and growing our society, I truly think that we have an opportunity, you know, the, there's risks and there's, there's been devastation and there's been death and that is always going to be there. And that's always going to hurt, uh, but it's, again, it's not necessarily the event. It's what we take, how we process, how we come through that, that decides if it's going to be post-traumatic stress or distress or uh, evolving some kind of disorder or if it's going to be post-traumatic growth. And I truly think if we do this right and we step back and we catch our breath and we really assess who we are as individuals and who we are as a society, we have a great opportunity to just kind of grow leaps and bounds. And that's, that's my hope is that we come out of this, um, you know, maybe, maybe a little disheveled, maybe a little bruised up, but a little wiser and a little more motivated to, to, um, uh, you, you know, make things, make a world that we, that we want to live in at this point. So. So for all of our viewers that are currently uh, watching us live on YouTube, uh, what sort of tips would you recommend for frontline workers, mm -hmm. uh, crisis responders, and even CISM teams that are current, currently undergoing all of these challenges uh, throughout the pandemic? Yeah, and, and everybody everybody has, you know, different approaches to different things. I, I, again, um, I look at those four parts, you know, that, that understanding the culture, um, you know, again, arm yourself for, with risk management tools, um, win by design, not by default, and then build that culture, not a program. You, you know, the daily mantra that I kind of circle back to for me is when I open my eyes, I, I go, oh, I got another chance. This is pretty cool. You know, um, so commit to what I call a mission or a purpose every day. You know, I, I people laugh at me when I say this, but if you can't figure out what you're going to do, you know, when you get out of bed, stay in bed till you do. And people go, well, I, I'd stay in bed for, for a week. No, nah, no, you wouldn't. And eventually, you know, you're going to figure it out. So have a purpose every day, commit to that purpose. And then it's, it's really important for us to take ownership for ourselves. And, and to me, that is simply being able to look into the mirror. Now, I can tell you from my own travels experiences, my own life experiences and my own journey that I took, there was a lot of years where um, that, was, that was really hard. And I look in the mirror and there's days when I don't like what I see. The difference is now I'm not afraid to look and say, warts and all, this is, this is, what, you, this is what you are. What are you going to do about it now? And I think that's a huge a piece of the puzzle that I was missing. And I think sometimes we were missing, you know, we often talk about this need to let people realize it's okay not to be okay. And that's, that's true. But we also have to encourage them to also do some things like it. Listen, if you're okay with how you are or what you're experiencing or where you're at in life, there's nothing wrong with that. But right. if you're you have to be part of your own solution. You know, as, as peer supporters, we're buoys. Um, you fall off the boat, you swim to me, and I'm going to let you hold on till you catch your breath, get some information, get some support, swim on your own. If you can't, that's okay. Got a bell on the light. Shake me. A boat comes. We take you. We get your check engine light, you know, looked at. We get you sort of out of the shop and back into the fight. What you can't do is live on that buoy. If you hang on the buoy, if you can't swim on your own and you won't get on that boat, you're going to drown and I'm going to watch it. And it's not because I want to, it's because I have no arms. I'm a buoy. 
I can't hold you up. I can only facilitate you holding yourself up. So that's where that personal ownership comes in. And little things, little bites, you know, take small bites. You don't have to fix everything. First of all, I don't like to turn, I, I say it myself, I catch myself. I don't like the term fix. Fix indicates something's broken. You know, you might, you, what's, what's broken? That is a, a whole different discussion. But, you know, if there's something you want to change, change it. Once you take care of the me, then you become accountable to and for your peers and the people you're with. But you got to take care of the me before you take care of the we. You sweep your own front stoop and then you take care of helping your neighbors out. So that's that's a technique of just sort of recentering and refocusing every day. Um, we also we also came up with something in the little piece of the world we work, I work in. We call it take five. And this is kind of an assessment we help people with. And the first thing is, you know, um, take a step back. Like if you're too close to a situation, sometimes figurative and literary, take a step back. So that distance not only buys you time, but it gives you some perspective on the, on the situation. So take a step back then take a deep breath. Don't forget to exhale. We think taking the deep breath, the most important part is getting that oxygenated, you know, air in that red room. Air. That is, that's hugely important, but it's just as important to expel all that nasty stuff that's going to get out of you. And right. that's, take a deep breath. Once you do that, take a look at what you have, not what you think you have, not what you'd like to have, not what you think you deserve, what you actually have on hand to work with, because that is the base to figure out the, the next plan. The next, take control. And for me, the hardest thing to realize was sometimes the best way to take control of a situation is to let go control of the situation. <laughs> If I can't impact it, it doesn't mean that I'm not aware of it. It doesn't mean that I'm not, you know, monitoring it. But if I really can't influence it, why am I, for lack of a better term, wasting my time and my energy over here when I can impact something over here? And then basically take charge. Start with something small. I call it cleaning the dirty car. Um, everybody has a different method for cleaning their car. Some people start here, they use different stuff, they use scrunches, they use this. Everybody has a thing. But you know what I know? I know very few people who, once they start cleaning that car, don't eventually clean the whole car. Because you can't drive down the street with half your car wax or the car on it. You, you can't, you know. Well, you could, but it would look funny. <laughs> right. Whip can't have dirt on half of the, you know. And you tend to clean the nooks and crannies because now you're, act, you go, oh, there's a scratch. Oh, there's a ding. Oh, the, you, you do the preventive maintenance things because now you're actually taking the time to look. So that take five, again, take a step back, take a breath, take a look, take control, which means maybe giving up control and then take charge. Do something small, little bites, little bites that are progressive will lead you to, you know, that end goal. Um, a lot of, a lot of our life too is, you know, and I, I wish somebody, well, people have told me this, but, um, and this sounds very pat and very passe, but you know what, even if you're out there cleaning the car, listen to your music, enjoy, enjoy the moment. Just find that song that makes you happy. Find that music that you find what that, that moment that defines you, because once you clean that car, the one thing I guarantee is it's going to get dirty again and you're going to do it. But that time you took cleaning it, you're never getting it back. You're never getting that back. Enjoy those small things because it's, it's the small things that, kind of matter um uh, there's a I, and i can't remember who said it but it's it's basically we're all bags of meat and we're trying to collect as much shiny things as we can i i, I mean that's kind of a morbid approach but it, right. it sort of brings it back to reality that you know um who dies with the most shiny things maybe it's not the maybe not the end goal that i want um so there are some 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 nuances some things but listen i have to tell you too I'm not a clinician. There are there are great through your, e, your your EAP. A good EAP has a concierge service that has everything from, you know, what to do to help your family to whatever. Take care of your business, you know, your finances, your childcare situation, you know, anything that that may cause you stress. Have a plan to mitigate that. Your mom, your dad, your families. So basically, clean your own house. The street, the calls for service, they will come. That's just part of the job, but you are going to be so much more uh, prepared to handle them if you, again, clean your own yard. Um, I failed for 30 years because I was trying to make good soldiers or good cops. 
if I would have recognized that I should be helping create better people, they are going to by proxy become better cops, firefighters, whatever, plumbers, teachers, astronauts. Um, so kind of that's the focus is, is down to that basic. Um, it starts with you and it's going to end with you and all the other stuff. That's the noise. You're going to play your song in a world of other music. You're going to play your song. And you know, you might be like the grunge or the metal guy who, who, you know, drops a step down to, to, so everything's flat and has that really cool sound and people might not dig your sound. It's okay. It's your sound find your music and being original you know cover bands are, are cool for a little bit but man there's nothing like creating your own song so and in a nutshell that's what i suggest well i'd like to thank you for all of those wonderful suggestions um uh, and if any of our viewers have actually enjoyed our discussion today and would like to learn more about this information you can actually become an ICISF member and read junk's latest lifenet article that actually uh, goes a little bit more in depth uh, based on our discussion today. Uh, ICISF offers individuals one-year membership for $60 and two-year membership for $95. You'll receive access to our member-only LifeNet newsletter, discounts on upcoming training, and uh, one set of CISM quick reference cards. You can learn more by visiting our website, icisf.org, uh, backslash sections, backslash membership, or just clicking the link in the description. Um, if you've already taken our core courses, our Law Enforcement Perspective CI for CISM Enhancement online course is actually coming up on June 14th through July 2nd. This online course provides practical back pocket skills in providing crisis intervention services to law enforcement organizations and individuals and in, uh, individual personnel in crisis. You can learn more about this online course and register on our website, icisf.org backslash online dash courses dash two. Uh, the link for this online course is also in the description. If you're interested, you can learn science-based wellness with our new asynchronous online course. Um, the Secret of Psychological Body Armor, Holistic Wellness for Emergency Personnel. This course is designed to aid you in building a personal culture of resilience and holistic health. You can register for this asynchronous online course on our website, icisf.org backslash self dash paste dash online, or click the link in the description. I'd like to thank you all as well as Junk for joining us today for our SISM Live series, where we connect with critical incident stress management, subject matter experts live on YouTube. You guys can join us next week on Wednesday, March 3rd at noon as we speak with Conrad Weaver on the PTSD 911 documentary film, Shining a Light on PTSD and First Responders. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on the next one. I hope everyone has a great week and thank you so much.